A subsidiary of pharmaceutical giant Johnson & Johnson has reached a $99 million settlement with the state of West Virginia over claims that the company used deceptive marketing practices to sell their painkillers and ultimately helped fuel the opioid addiction crisis. Back in February, Johnson & Johnson already agreed to pay $5 billion as part of a nationwide opioid lawsuit against large pharmaceutical manufacturers. Despite yesterday's settlement, Johnson & Johnson did not admit to liability or wrongdoing. Meanwhile, West Virginia is still pursuing litigation against two other pharma manufacturers for their alleged role in driving the opioid addiction in the state. Those claims are currently playing out in a trial that began earlier this month in the Kanawaha County Circuit Court. Staff writer for the Charleston Gazette Mail, Katie Coyne, has been in the courtroom closely following the story, and she joins us now to explain what's led to this settlement. So welcome to Rising, Katie. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. So tell us more about what's at stake in this case, what's happening. Yeah, we're on um, day 12 today. It's been um, long going. And then obviously we had the settlement yesterday with Johnson & Johnson. So um, with them out of the case, they're kind of going straight ahead here against Teva and Allergan. Um, Johnson leaving the case, though, I mean, that, that brought down the witness case or the witness list um, pretty noticeably. I think they cut 20 witnesses off there. So, I mean, we could be in these proceedings until May 27th is what the attorney general said. Um, and, you know, it could end sooner if they end up settling with the other companies involved, which um, I, I don't I don't know which would be better. I don't know if they know either, but I think their goal, at least the state's goal, is trying to recoup what has been lost in the state in the last 20 years, 30 years, um, and the cost that we've accrued trying to fight this epidemic and, and keep people alive throughout it. Well, help us understand what are the kinds of facts that have come out during the trial that has led Johnson & Johnson to settle. It's an incredibly uh, deep-pocketed company. It certainly has the ability to pursue, the, you know, to withstand this kind of litigation and has done so many times in the past. What do you think were the facts that finally pushed it to go ahead and want to settle at this point? You know, I'm not sure what specifically led J&J &J to taking the settlement. Um, there wasn't anything specific on Thursday when they started mm. having settlement talks in the courtroom that came up against Johnson & Johnson. Mostly a lot of what we've been um, hearing here has been about Cephalon, which was a is a subsidiary of Teva. Teva took over that company in uh, 2011. So, but, but generally all, all the arguments that have been le leveled by the state have applied to all three of the companies named here, mm. um, that they use misleading marketing practices to increase opioid prescriptions and, and didn't educate doctors correctly on the risks of those opioids. Um, and, and, I, and I don't know quite what the burden was that, that pushed them into a settlement. And I don't know what that line is going to be for the other two companies involved. And I think we're seeing these arguments develop day by day here um, and, and generally along the same lines. They, they're hitting the same points every day or similar points. And, and the defendants are coming back against the same points. Of They say that their drugs are only responsible for less than 1% of West Virginia's opioid overdose deaths in that time. Um, and, and it's hard to quantify what that real loss was, I think, for the state. Well, for people who maybe are not familiar with these kinds of cases, can you give us a sense of uh, how you know, uh, the guidelines on prescriptions are affecting how often these drugs are being prescribed? Because I think to the average American, they might think, oh, well, doctors are using their independent judgment as doctors uh, to prescribe these kind of medications. How could they possibly be misled in this way? What What's the case that's being made? Right. And um, what, they're, what they're saying essentially is between the 90s into the early 2000s, there was a, um, a collaboration of all of these pharmaceutical companies along with these professional organizations that really worked to push just a body of information into the medical community that um, that made it more appealing to prescribe opioids. And then they uh, were very effective in changing state policies and state guidelines for medical boards. So if you weren't prescribing opioids, you could be potentially um, penalized for under treatment of chronic pain. Hmm. So these these efforts were really successful is what they're arguing. And, and it is, I mean, there's a steep increase between, you know, the mid early to mid 90s into the early to later 2000s of just opioid prescriptions going all the way up. Um, and it's hard to say what company did what I think because it was so together that it was, it was a whole movement. They were involved with each other 
you could educate on opioids in general and get doctors to prescribe more opioids um, without the brand on there, without saying it was oxycodone or cadian or whatever the drug was, then that made these manufacturer's jobs more easy. So if they already had doctors that were willing for, to prescribe opioids and they roll a new product out, they could take it and then give it to their patients. And um, what we're seeing and hearing today about a lot is how that eventually led you know, in the later 2000s into heroin addictions and to mm. other types of opioids that are a lot harder, I think, to understand and to even treat because they're illicit drugs. Mm. Yeah, I mean, and I think that shows what's challenging about cases like this because obviously under-prescribing people who are in horrible pain, you know, medication they need to address that is itself a, a public health crisis, but you know, obviously right. at some point we went yeah, and there's the other way. this weird catch-22 where, of course, you know, there's been reporting on how there's this enormous gap between how often opioids were prescribed to black Americans versus white Americans, in part because of different understandings of, you know, this, this feeling that black Americans are in less pain and uh, suspicion that people who are requesting uh, pain relief are simply seeking, doing drug-seeking behavior. So there is this perverse advantage that, ha that you know, black Americans haven't seen the same spike in opioid rates historically that white communities have, although it's leveling over time. But of course, that indicates that this isn't just a plain old instance of people prescribing things when they're medically indicated. And um, I'm sure that probably came up at some point in the trial. Well, Katie, what is the reaction you know, to this trial in, in the community that you're in? Is there a, a lot of sentiment along the lines of, you know, these companies need to be held accountable for, for what they've done? Or, you know, what is what is the people's sentiment? I think that tends to be the widest sentiment. Um, people, it's impossible to live here and not see what opioids have done to our communities, to our families, to our people. Um, you quite literally, if you're in West Virginia, you walk out your door in the morning and you, you see it, you see people who are struggling and, and you don't know where that came from or what their individual story is, but it is a somewhat universal thing. Um, it, but I think a, a big part of that too is apprehension. We get a lot of promises in West Virginia that people are going to come and, and, you know, they'll be held accountable. But I think a lot of the people here feel like they are often thrown under the bus um, to pad pockets of, of corporations and people in charge and people in authority. And, you know, this is the second case, the opioid case that we see unfolding here in as many years. We had one in Huntington Wrap um, a few months ago, and they still haven't seen a verdict for that. So this is different. Mm. It's, it's a different kind of case. But um, I think people in West Virginia are a little used to being let down. So mm -hmm. they are hoping for the best, but very, very cautiously. Well, Katie Coyne, thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm happy to do it. More Rising right after this.